This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, so this is going to be the last video probably before you get to Black Friday sales and all that kind of crazy stuff going on. Happy American Thanksgiving. If you celebrate it, this is going to be the board game episode. There's always an RPG episode to go with it. If you feel the need, you can jump ahead and just check out the description or the little chapter points and things in the time bar, and that'll help you out. Um, if you have anything that you need to say, feel free to subscribe, comment, and share the, the page with other folks if you feel the need to. And uh, keep coming back every week to get this kind of information about everything that's coming out on Kickstarter. I do everything I can to cast a very wide net and bring everybody in. Uh, that being said, it's getting close to the end of the year, and I think for Black Friday, if things are slow at work, I'm going to try to do the Kingdom Death video uh, where I took all the stuff that should save you time, and I think I can get uh, table, uh, Kingdom Death from the box to the tabletop ready to play in under three minutes. Uh, I know I can do it under five with the stuff that I improved on, but uh, if that's been a hindrance to you of getting your games to the table, because time, maybe the organization strategies and things that I use for a big game like Kingdom Death will help you uh, apply that just about anywhere. A little bit of wood, a little bit of cardboard goes a long way to uh, make it so you can get the stuff out on the table with your family. And uh, maybe they'll want to jump in and enjoy some of these too. I am going to get critical on some of these uh, campaigns. I just know off the bat. And I try to be constructive. Please try to be constructive too. And uh, if you do let these folks know, you know, that they could improve on their campaigns, then uh, maybe everybody will be a lot better off. It's harder when I do it because that's just a guy yelling at them. And maybe if a backer su suggested it to him, it'd be a little more effective and everybody would have a better gaming experience. That's what we're trying to do here. That's the end of my rant. Let's jump on it. All right, first up we have clue cards. These are Christmas puzzle adventures and some type of Secret Santa thing. The idea is there's a bunch of different uh, postcards and like greeting card type things that are used to play games. And you can either send them to people or take them with you wherever you're going to be doing some, uh, I don't know, eating dinner or whatever the case is. And uh, you can play it with folks and uh, maybe even spread them around, pass them around uh, different ways. So if you're interested in that kind of idea, it's uh, theoretically an escape room in the palm of your hand as they describe it. And uh, you can uh, pick it up now and send it off to all your friends and have a wonderful, well-distanced uh, holiday, especially if you have friends that are from uh, many different parts of the world. Maybe they'd enjoy getting the mail and popping on a different kind of stamp and all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, something to think about. Then for the European wargamers out there, we have East Front. This is a giant wargaming map, and you can get different versions of it. It's, uh, I think, neoprene. It's 68 inches by 44 inches. So that is approximately a meter and a half by two meters plus a third. So like 230 centimeters by 150-ish centimeters. It's around that range, so I'm just doing the math off the top of my head. Um, but uh, yeah, big, big map. If you uh, need something for some big, big gaming, you can throw it on the uh, the rug or whatever because it's neoprene. Uh, wherever you have a space, if you do have a giant table, then that is a good spot for it too. And uh, hopefully it'll resist whatever you might spill on it. But don't spill on anything on it, maybe not. Um, or maybe spill it on Russia and it'll be like Gorbachev's head. I don't know. That part's up to you. But if you need a big old map, here's one. And if you ever wanted to work at Benihana, but you're not old enough, here's Hibachi. Um, the idea is you've got a bunch of Asian-themed pet critters. Uh, there's the... Uh, was it Shiba Inu, I think, is the name of the, the type of dog and the cats that they have and all that. And you're going to take a bunch of ingredients and try to make a uh, fun little plate going around. It is a dexterity game, so as you throw stuff around, that part matters. It has poker chips and different dollars and t different things to act as the, uh, the ingredients and other stuff you're going to use. So if you got a good space and, uh, you know, nobody's going to get too crazy throwing things, then maybe this will be a fun way to uh, not go out to dinner but have that dinner-ish kind of experience at home. 
Then we have a 3D printing required game, and I usually put these on the RPG episode, but this time there wasn't really much of a reason, I think, to put it on an RPG episode. The minis aren't quite the quality of the other stuff that would be for RPGs. They're okay. They work pretty well on both FDM and Resin, which is fine if you're just looking for a way to play a tactics game on your uh, FDM printer, then uh, this is a good opportunity to do that since it's not as highly detailed as what you would get for resin. Although, as you can see there, it will be additionally detailed because of the way the resin printer will work. Um, otherwise, it's a, it's a tactic game. This is series two. There's a series one. If you've already played it or you want to expand out, then this would be a perfect opportunity to do it. Like I say, the molds and, and the models and things are okay, but when you have the incredibly extensively detailed things that you can do with, with resin, already in the RPG market, I just didn't want to like combine them because then they'll just look bad and they're not bad, they're fine. It's just you know a simpler uh, type of game uh, and a simpler uh, setup for it. And I don't think a lot of these models necessarily would be utilized in an RPG, but uh, maybe they'll be a nice upgrade for another board game that you have. Then if you've ever looked at a Rubik's Cube and said, hey, that looks like a racetrack to me, Reality Shift is the game for you. The uh, way that these cubes are set up, I think they're magnetic or the pieces might be magnetic. The uh, track is built on them and they flip and change around and you set things up however you want to go. There have been a few games that have tried to do the magnetic thing on multiple surfaces to uh, use more than a, a top-down gravitational uh, direction and they've been weird like one of them was inside of a cube and it was just kind of hard i criticized it for trying to get your arms and hands in it because i'm a giant and i would not be able to play the game but if you're a little tiny child then you'd be able to get your hands in no problem and you know curve your neck around to see where everything's at this is a better implementation being on the outside so if you were looking for something that is a little bit different, then uh, I think it's a great idea. It's evocative of the running your cars, you know, the little matchbox cars or whatever on every surface in the house and playing it that way. Now you get some rules and you see who can win the race. It's got a couple of different ships and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think you would paint this, I'll be honest with you, because the color variances and the way that the track works and the contrast and everything... I think it just would be best to play right out of the box, and if you're that type of gamer, it'd be fun for you not to have to worry about painting. And this is the point of the episode where the computer actually caught fire, and I had to pop in an entirely different video card that I had lying around. And let's hope it lasts to be able to actually render things out. It's, the quality might go down, things are going to get a lot slower, but that just happens. Uh, one cool thing though, hey! The artwork I have in my uh, bedroom is there on the right. Alphonse Mucha, who was one of the uh, more acclaimed Czech um, painters, artists of his time. His time being late 1800s, early 1900s, as this new wave of uh, types of art uh, comes through. Everything changes, all the things you see on absinthe bottles and all the other stuff. The Century Guild is a group in Los Angeles that used to be a museum. Right now, I don't know what the story is, but they make wonderful prints, books, all that kind of cool stuff, and I like to highlight them when they have a new Kickstarter available. And this one is on uh, Alphonse Mucha's Le Pater, which is a, um, a, a painting that they've been pushing a lot of different prints for for a long time. If you're interested in this kind of artwork, I don't think you can find a better representation of it. And hey, there you go. But let's keep going and hope that we can make it through all the episodes. Then we have another one for the War Gamers, more of a naval battle system of a fantasy variety. This is the Drowned and the Damned, would be a great metal band name, um, but also is a bunch of steampunk, elven, fantasy types of battle warships that I believe you would play like you would just about any other naval skirmish. So if you've been waiting for something that is a little bit less of a... Um, uh, realistic battle then maybe this will be it for you they can also provide some STL files as you can see there so you can print them off yourself and save some cash if you so desire so there you go then we have something really strange it's hard to describe it's like a cross between a campaign game and Galaxy Quest um, in the sense that cosplayers stole an alien ship 
and now you have a 36 story campaign <laughs> to go through yeah uss freedom um it the, the name of just being a ship i don't know if it like fully will tell you what an expansive campaign game it is and i think that kind of throws people off ship designs look pretty neat it uses standees and models so uh gloomhaven does too right but it doesn't necessarily show that it has um the amount of depth <laughs> necessarily that uh, gloomhaven would have it's a uh, it's not quite as um as in-depth uh i don't i keep saying the word depth whatever <laughs> I stopped a fiery inferno in the computer and I brought it back to life to make the episodes. So I'm a little distracted, but I'm trying to get through it. Bear with me. And uh, we still have the ships and uh, everything that would happen in here. So if you're looking for something long, you're looking for a long game, you can play with friends that uh, is in a space theme and hopefully is less complicated than Gloomhaven, then maybe USS Freedom is for you. I just think that the marketing suggests that it's maybe like a skirmish game, but that doesn't seem to be what it is. And if you thought Utah might be boring, the video for this game is not going to help. Uh, story card game is it is an icebreaker uh, at its heart. You are supposed to have some point of getting in depth with uh, different categories of thought. So intellectual or physical or whatever, and you're supposed to tell a story. It's like the weirdest truth or dare game in the pg -est sense possible that uh, you're probably going to walk away <laughs> crying <laughs> from each other's stories. Like, it doesn't feel like a game because it doesn't make it feel like it'll feel good to get these things off your chest or whatever. But, uh, I mean, if you were in like a Scientology interrogation room, then you'd probably get these same types of questions uh, thrown at you. It's all kinds of weird. Um, for certain people, it might be great. You know, they're from a healthy place. <laughs> but you're going to find out which one of your friends is not real quickly if you're going to, like, delve into their their uh, deepest meanings. It looks like it's something that four-year-olds should be playing because of the way the artwork works. But they don't have any life experience <laughs> to play anything like this or even understand the words. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's deceiving uh, artwork-wise, again, on this one. A little bit better truth in advertising, we've got Rapture. This is a tabletop war game where aliens call themselves angels, look like angels, and are fighting against the futuristic corporations and the Atlanteans that pop up from the depths, and everybody's doing everything they can to take over a new world order. That sounds like a game, when I look at this box, when I look at this title, that sounds like the game I'm supposed to be picking up. So kudos for them. They did a good job. Now what do the pieces look like? All right. There is a print and play version. And you can uh, get that with these little uh, pyramidal figures. I like the design of that because other than just regular standees, if you look at it from my perspective, again, I tell you guys I'm a giant. It's because I am. And uh, when you look down on them, it's harder to see. But with this pyramid structure, no matter where you're oriented on the table or your elevation based on where your eye line is, you can see the stuff on the table a lot easier. As long as the squares are big enough to hold it, it shouldn't be that big a deal. Uh, but otherwise, it's a great looking game that uh, is very similar to other stuff I have, which is the only reason why I wouldn't be backing it now. But it looks like something that will be extensible in the future to have some great minis, a great story. That kind of thing going on so if you're into tabletop wargaming this might be another one for you to pick up or a place where you can get started without too much of an investment because the print and play options are there now we have another one of those games that's going to hit you in weird places if you research it this is about the first day of world war ii where a bunch of polish uh post office workers are defending the post office against an ss attack in danzig and it's a solitaire game. You can play on your own. It's assault on... Uh, I, mean, I don't even want to say, like, because that John Carpenter movie, Assault on Precinct 13, maybe it could be that kind of feel for you, but because it's real, it's more like Assault on Precinct 13 would take its uh, <laughs> uh, inspiration from this story. DVG, they do a bunch of stuff with uh, cards, and we've had them many, many times here on Kickstarters. 
and uh, that part's been great. They're a company that likes to do a lot of things with a lot of different war theaters and time periods and all that. So this one is a little bit of a departure in the sense that it's got dice and, and not just cards. They've been expanding out a little bit. I think they picked a great story. I think this would be very interesting. When I found out about it, I'm like, the post office? They were defending you against... The, I mean, going postal is a totally different idea in Poland from the way these guys must have had to fight that part off. I mean, ultimately, we know what happens, um, you know, with uh, the, that 1939 time period. But uh, just fighting tooth and nail and all that, it's a great time for a story. And maybe we could rewrite history a little bit better. Then we have a Roman-themed um, game about tile laying and creating mosaics. This is Tessera, and it is not doing well. Uh, it's having a hard time explaining, I think, what the game is. Um, I, I don't know if this is inspiration for the word Tesseract, but maybe it is for having multiple facets and uh, all that kind of stuff. The idea is you're going to curry favor from the different gods by creating these mosaics uh, in various ways. Uh, I don't know how it competes with something like Asul. Um, there's so many other games out there right now that are hitting that space and picking up all the cash. I don't know if there's a big demand for it. Maybe that's not why it's uh, it's doing as well as you would hope. Uh, sitting at about 10% of, of its... Um, you know, total that it needs to be in order to be able to be funded. So that's a difficult way to go. Uh, I've never played a Soul, so I don't know how this would necessarily compare. If you have Tabletop Simulator, though, and you have, you can check this out and see if it's uh, worth your, your money. Maybe it's better, maybe it's not, but at least you can try it beforehand. Then we have a... Um, this is, as best that I can describe it, the most pared-down form of Awaken Realms version of Nemesis that I've seen. Uh, basically you are in the same type of story. The uh, ship is going to be uh, destroyed in, by, in some capacity and you have to run around and figure out uh, how to get various resources and escape and blow up the ship. Which is basically what Nemesis is. Um, if you're looking for something that's less complicated, it obviously has fewer minis. They're more of a cartoony type of look to them. Um, it pared down to be something a little less uh, alien-esque, xenomorph-esque, but they still have aliens, robots, and all that kind of stuff in it. So uh, if you were looking for something that just got straight to the heart uh, of the game, has a nice um, layout, I think it's 16, it's 12, 16 cards instead of a big board and that type of thing, you might be able to get it out quicker. And a few less rules to go by and a little less catastrophe, but still... You know, you're you're trying to make your way to to success and get off this doomed ship. Then uh, Mission Catastrophe from Cardboard Alchemy may be the way to go, and it'll be a lot less money than Nemesis if you were not able to find that. Then we have a game coming out of Slovenia, which is interesting. This is the World Game, and I think it might be the best preparation for the Jeopardy test possible. <laughs> it has all kinds of information about, uh, as you can see. Uh, there with Brazil, it has the flag, has a little bit of information at whatever point in time it was, um, uh, you know, described at. So the area is not going to change much, but population will. GDP is, is all over the place. Highest point and neighboring country amounts uh, aren't going to change too much. Flags maybe a little bit, but uh, for the most part, capital should stay the same. That kind of fun stuff. So if you're trying to learn about world geography, if uh, you got a kid that's just starting to take that or if you're like me and you want to take the Jeopardy test because you think that maybe it'll be a great way to pay off your college loans then maybe picking this game up will be a way to uh, just kickstart your way into um, that type of study path and uh, yeah just keep in mind sometimes those maps change so uh, just like having an old Trivial Pursuit game <laughs> sitting around you might uh, get some, uh, there might be a point where it's no longer uh, viable, but otherwise I think you can have it sit around for probably a good 10 years maybe and uh, get some enjoyment out of it and quiz, uh, quiz your kids, why not? And a little bit different, but still for the family, is Creature Comforts. And this has all different types of cute little meeples and whatnot from animal folk that uh, you run around and try to gather nuts and berries or tomatoes apples all the kind of weird stuff 
that you would get after the uh, winter has thawed out and you're trying to make your little uh, living space more comfortable, be you porcupine, fox, raccoon, squirrel, or other form of mammalian life. And, uh, you know, it's just a different way to teach nature. It doesn't have to get all the, the, the gritty details correct. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't have to have all the, the carnivorous aspects, even though there is apparently an owl there. Um, but it might be a fun game as the winter starts to thaw out. People might be thinking about getting different types of pets or, you know, just exploring the idea of uh, biology and what's out there in the, uh, the various parts of the world. Maybe you'll even be able to go camping sometime uh, later on in 2021 and uh, you know have your all vaccined up and all that kind of cool stuff ready to hit the RV and get out of the house and this might be a fun way for you to prep for that get everybody ready to go out and go see some fun stuff and then uh, make your, your trip out and maybe play it while you're you're out there camping then we have rule benders which has taken all the different mechanics that you see in board games and found ways to break them and, and put it on cards so that you can mix and match the ways in which you break it and that makes it so that you have a replayable fun game each and every time the uh, art style is a little eclectic because there's all kinds of weird stuff going on it's meant to be a generic experience that is somehow uh, through randomization made into a specific experience and fun I think if you have people that are very experienced at board games and tactics based on um, hard uh, hand size or amount of cards you can draw or can't draw or um, other just just about anything so take that <laughs> whatever their experience level the higher experience level there is the more they're able to strategize I think those people will have the most fun with this and I think they'll have a lot of fun with this because they'll have to think on the fly instead of uh, just always trying to necessarily beat the same game over and over again that it'll be a new game almost entirely every time you play it based on the shuffle. Then we have a heist game. This is the Specialists. And it's a bit like Ocean's Eleven in the sense everybody has their own little unique thing that they're good at and you get to play it. And you get to go through, I believe it is seven different uh, types of heists and you figure out the best team, figure out what the best things available to you, roll some dice, allocate your resources, and try to pull the whole thing off I like the idea of heists. Um, I it would I have not found the perfect game just yet. Uh, a lot of this is in French, and the video is in French, so you're going to have to do some reading. But uh, I think that it might be a lot of fun. We have some folks that listen to the channel that are from uh, French Canada, Canada, French Canada. It's not Canadian. Canadians live in French Canada, and uh, from France. And maybe they'd be uh, very excited about this, especially since it's in their own language. Then we have the return of Banana Hammock, and it still has a terrible name, but this time it's funded. Um, if they had just changed it to Monkey Business or something else, I think they could have had everything work really, really well, except having the uh, backs of the cards and then uh, and the box. Because imagine your kid shows up and says, hey, we played uh, with the banana hammock over at Timmy's house or Timmy's dad whipped out banana hammock and we all had a good time. You're going to look a little funny. You're the one that's going to look like the molester, <laughs> not them. So I think something for an eight year old maybe shouldn't have the uh, connotation given to it. Maybe for an 18 year old, then make the game that's called Banana Hammock. You're not taking it back for the non pervs, you're just looking like a perv. So, yeah. Then we have a nice, relaxing aqua garden. This is for uh, people that want an aquarium, they can't have one, or they want a, uh, is it a basking whale? Uh, whale shark, possibly, in their home and they can't get one. They got all kinds of neat looking meeples, all different types of uh, painted fish, turtles, all that kind of cool stuff. And uh, if you're jonesing for an opportunity to get to the aquarium, then maybe this will be the one for you. Uh, this comes out July of 2021, so I would say around August. So if you haven't otherwise been able to make it, then uh, these schools of fish 
and other crazy things that you can throw into your size limited uh, fish tank would be a lot of fun. There's also an Arctic expansion that has polar bears and uh, different types of penguins and all that kind of fun stuff. And then they have uh, another one called Amalfi in Age of Hunting that are other games that are in their little world. All neat, meeple-driven animal games. And if you're interested in any of that, go ahead and contact the folks there in Japan and they will send one to you in July. Then if you have a lot of money and you need a console version of a board game, Square One is attempting to be that. You have these, I don't know if they're RFID, but that's probably the technology that they're using, uh, enabled chips along with the accelerometer dice that are thrown into this walk looking thing. And I'll be honest, the thing I like most about it is the walk. Uh, it looks like you keep your dice contained. It's easy to see the top. It's not gonna fall on one thing or another. And it, they go in and then they slide back down and they go to wherever their resting place is. I like the design and look of the walk, but uh, that's not what this is. This is a several hundred dollar game system that doesn't necessarily have the games you know. It has the games that will work with it. Um, I think it's more of a proof of concept type of thing than anything else right now. And certain specific pieces will have to work in certain specific ways. The cards themselves are also supposed to have some type of like tap ability. And I don't know if they're getting that um, off of uh, like a fob card or if that's the way that they're set up. But you can embed into a playing card an RFID controller. They are that small. So it's hard to say which one's which, uh, if this is worth your money or not. But it's one of many that are going to be coming out. Then we have Tales of Elythrian, an adventure board game, which is based on the three kickstarted um, animated series episodes that have been out before. So the art style and everything is for that animation, if you've already enjoyed it. Um, it's out of Copenhagen, Denmark, so I don't know if uh, it's in English or not. I uh, wasn't really able to find any info on the cartoon itself as to how successful it is or how many people watch it or anything like that but if it's had its uh, fans that have kickstarted it three different times that's great the animation looks okay it looks like it'll be a fun interesting experience to me it looks a little bit like it would be uh, like a thousand and one nights type of world and the uh, minis and all that look okay too if it is a standard and fun adventure experience that takes place within an established and interesting world. I don't see how you could go wrong, especially if you're a fan. And uh, maybe it'll make you interested enough to want to go seek out the uh, cartoon and, you know, give it a shot. Maybe it's good. Obviously, there's enough people that were willing to shell out money to get, give it a couple sequels. So that's always a good sign. So if you're interested in any of that info, click on the link and uh, you'll be able to uh, start checking it out. Then for all the metal fans out there if that were looking for a deck builder in a co-op space, this is Gods of Metal, and uh, it's supposed to have all of that stuff going on. Not a big board, not a bunch of minis, anything like that, so you get all of your album cover wor worthy uh, Satans right there in the cards. You can play whatever type of rocker you need to be in order to uh, save the day. Uh, some of the folks, they look like Slash or uh, a little bit reminiscent of Lemmy. Um, the artwork looks pretty cool um, in the sense that it looks like an Iron Maiden uh, album cover, uh, same type of style, just without Eddie. But uh, otherwise, it flows just like you would have any other deck building card uh, adventure. So if you want to uh, live the metal, you can put on whatever your favorite band is that screams at the top of their lungs and uh, otherwise ends up. You know, maybe they, they have that high pitch voice, maybe they sound like Cookie Monster, whatever the type of metal you're into, maybe this will be the one for you. I prefer Ozzy, that's just, you know, for me. And then Joe Magic is a company I would have no idea about if it wasn't for all of you guys uh, that for like their small games. And this is the return of Levitation. They tried to launch it before, and then I'm sure, you know, the pandemic and everything had a big factor on whether or not it was able to come out. And here they are again. They've 
uh, specialized previously in dozens of very small games that uh, they would produce themselves, they would sell themselves, and they gave you a guarantee if you didn't like it, they would even give it, you your money back or give you another game that you might like better. And uh, they would do stuff with, I think it was Game Crafter, very simple components. This is a little more complex. This is the first time that they've done uh, this level of artwork, that they've done this level of components. So they kind of learn their lessons in making different small games, and now they're trying to work their way up slowly into bigger ones. And you have to applaud them for it, for making that kind of effort and uh, investment in the time and energy to make something good. So I know some of you guys are big fans of uh, Joe Magic Games, and uh, here they are growing up a little bit and expanding out into a different world. And Hopefully you follow them and you still enjoy their games as they uh, get a little more complicated. And then we have Faction Fighters, and these guys are at 5% of what they need to be in order to make this work. And that's a problem. Uh, what is the problem? What can we suggest to them? When they have basically Pokemon, it is difficult to not suggest to people to not just play Pokemon. And uh, that's kind of the, the challenge here is to break out and show that there's something other than that. And that doesn't mean necessarily that it's... a uh, oh, this is an adventure game. It's like, well, then it's like Pokemon the cartoon, but it's not Pokemon. And um, they, they need to break out of that. Some The, the art on the cards, art on the, the uh, box, everything, looks too much like Pokemon. So they need to take the page and give uh, some more background to the characters, maybe, in the page to try to get people more excited um, to see that you know it's something else other than uh, just a clone of a bigger franchise and that might help break out uh, what the game is supposed to be. Chances are though I think five grand might be the best that they'll pull off so coming down from the goal that they're at right now it, it'll probably be back around but when they do it back around don't just copy paste the um, Kickstarter page. Uh, try to actually give each character some more background story and maybe that'll bring people in. Then a game that has no story. It can't go. It's about poop. Um, when Eddie Murphy first got started, he used to go on stand-up and just uh, mimic Richard Pryor, but he didn't have any life experience, so he would just talk about pooping, because everybody has that. And I understand the concept of everybody poops, because Sam Jackson, uh, is he the one that, I think he, he read that story at some point. I know he did the go to after sleep one, but you know, there is the story that they read to kids now that everybody poops and that part's true. But you know what? Not everyone wants to play a game about it. So, um, you know, if you want to talk about extending your turd length, uh, or the amount of corn you'd find in it, and you think that's funny, um, then this is the game for you. Uh, if it's if this is too simplistic, not necessarily blue, but just too simple, then you got to find something else. There's one about like a tapeworm and some other ones that came out earlier in the year, maybe last year, that might be more your your style. But if you uh, want to play with like a five year old's uh, sense of humor, then this might be the thing for you. And then we have a strategy game called Rawhide that is supposedly set in the old west for the family, and uh, it's from Missoula, Montana. One of the most attractive women I've ever met in life was from there as well. And this is the total opposite of that. <laughs> this is a, an ugly game. And uh, the reason why it is, it looks like it has a bunch of 3D renders of things that are very, very incomplete. And when you put this on the shelf next to other um, items or other things that pop up, especially in the Kickstarter world and all that, it just looks unfinished. Um, the uh, backgrounds on the box need to be completed out with more detail and then maybe that would sell the the rest of the image and make it overall look less bad maybe make an actual sky out of something that might help them um, the cards themselves when they start some of them look okay like the the guns and the cows and all that but that gold rush card and you still have that um, it somehow looks worse than Minecraft, yet it has more polygons kind of look to it. It's hard to make the sell. Art sells so much and also prevents 
some great games from making their way uh, into people's homes because they just didn't sell them. It just, by the art not looking complete, they think that the rest of the contents might not be complete. And I talked about uh, heists, how I thought that that would be a great game. Well, this is like what happens after the heist or a different type of heist. This is the jailbreak. This is Escape to Freedom Sabotage, where you have folks doing the same types of things trying to break out, but there may be an undercover cop as one of the players uh, or characters, and uh, they could screw you up as you're trying to escape. I like the idea. Um, it's design-wise, it looks a little bit like, uh, what was it? It's called Prison Manager or something like that. Uh, it's another game. And that game is dark beyond belief dark for the uh, meeple look of the video game. I was like, oh man, there's so many horrible things that happen in this game. Uh, this does not look to be the case. Like, you get caught, that's the worst that can happen. But there's lots of different tools, such as shovels and dynamite and whatever weird shiv type things you might need in order to, to fulfill your, your escape uh, plan. And uh, I like the idea of it. It might be fun if you can get other folks to jump in then uh, they can enjoy it too. This is probably the third or fourth jailbreak uh, game we've seen this year. So you just have to decide which one's your favorite and which one you want to pick up. And then we have another trend that's been happening this year with people selling tables. And this is a tabletop for your tabletop uh, system. It has rails and rotation. But one of the things I'd like to make you consider is inertia. So as you push, or as the, the rails stop, or as the spin starts, as the spin stops, inertia is going to possibly make your pieces move. So uh, depending on the type of game you play, neoprene mats are going to be great for this kind of thing. Uh, weighted down minis are going to be real good. Magnetism, fantastic if you have that uh, available to you. Um, but this may be a way for you to save your games. Maybe it's a way to keep things clean. It is elevated, so maybe if you had some snacks or whatever, you don't get too many things on the table. And uh, it lets you uh, push the game closer to somebody who might need to read something or see something. If you've had those problems in the past, and that's the only thing holding, back you from, uh, holding you back from having a more fulfilling gaming experience, these folks out of Indiana might have the secret sauce for what ails you. And then a campaign of one of the worst names I've ever seen uh, canceled, so we can jump straight to Theorem. It is like Gin Rummy and Uno mixed together. So the cards and everything look like an Uno set, but uh, the game plays out like uh, Gin Rummy. If you are a fan of that type of game and uh, you know, you're know you not otherwise bored with it, then maybe you'd play... If you weren't bored, you'd, you might play with a regular deck. If you are bored, then maybe you'll jump in on Theorem. Uh, if you're colorblind or um, having a hard time seeing the cards uh, and the numbers and the values, then these are great for that. So a lot of older folks might be interested in playing uh, Gin Rummy, older than the people that watch my videos even. So if you're watching this, your your parents uh, or your grandparents might be the just boss of Gin Rummy. And maybe this would be a game that you can bring in and play with them on that uh, it's not a game that I spent a lot of time with because the only things that we learned how to play as we were kids were ways to cheat at gambling. So otherwise, if you are more in the gaming side of things, then uh, maybe this will be more fun for you, especially if you got uh, three or two or three other players to, to go with you for a total of three or four. And that's it. My office still smells like smoke, so I'm going to do what I can just to try to get through and render this episode out so I can get it to you and uh, hopefully make it also through the RPG episode. We'll see where life takes me throughout the week. I hope you guys have a fulfilling and filling Thanksgiving. I hope you're still managed to stay healthy and uh, don't get sick. Uh, if you were able to socially distance, that part's cool. Um, if you can uh, play some games, that would be great. You want to let me know what you guys are going to be playing. That's always fun. Anything you found interesting, uh, you know, that's always cool too. Or, uh, you know, let me know if you know anybody who's going to have a 3070 NVIDIA card uh, rolling around since uh, that's about the same replacement cost as uh, what I lost when that 970 blew. 
but uh, that being the case I'm gonna take off uh, if you had a question as to why I'm using Nvidia instead of uh, AMD it's for some compatibility things with software that I use and uh, the AMD stuff isn't as compatible um, I have to use the Nvidia and Intel uh, back and forth in order to use the different uh, work programs that I've got so you know I hear your suggestions in advance I already got it down I'm just gonna have to to stick with Nvidia for now and uh, if you guys can like share and subscribe that would be great you guys have a good one